speakers may, have not, may not have time to come yet. So when, when we're on a time, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with the two videos. So we're waiting, but you also hear the voice from the leaders and also how we like them to translate into the negotiation table. While we're doing that, we are welcoming more speakers coming in and then we will uh, go through the program. So today's program, mostly we're inviting both speakers, both from parties and non-parties. And the audience are all both from parties and non-parties. We're basically coming together to, to say, to, 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 to hear, to share, what is our expectation to a strong outcome for GBF and the COP15. So in a way, our voices can be shared um, among here, but also into the negotiation room so that we know what the future that we want and how we can get about it. So with that, I just uh, ask any, because I don't know all the speakers, if you're confirmed speakers, please do come sit inside the circle so we will, we will talk about it. We will have a moving mic, it's all on. So when you speak, you just pick a one mic around you and then that's others can hear louder uh, for you. Let me check the time. Okay, three o'clock. Um, so let me get started, yeah? They're on their way, okay, then, then I wait a little bit. Um, they're on their way. Maybe I show you the video then, right? Do you like it? Okay, so can we get the first video on? Thank you. By 2030, we must halt and reverse biodiversity loss and protect at least 30% of the world's land and oceans. Fiji reaffirms our commitment to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030 and secure a transformative global biodiversity agreement that delivers a nature-positive world this decade for all. Germany resolutely supports the idea of an ambitious global framework on biodiversity. Such a framework needs a strong implementation mechanism that sets us on a path to saving and restoring our ecosystems. And must respect the rights of indigenous peoples and reinforce their critical role as guardians and the place of traditional knowledge in restoring nature. Finland underlines the importance of nature-based solutions to conserve, restore and sustainable use and manage our ecosystems. There needs to be a shift away from economic models that value growth for growth's sake towards a circular economy. We must work towards having a nature positive world. Biodiversity is an important basis, a goal and a means for achieving sustainable development. And we're committed to being a leader in the global fight to solve them. Sin embargo, todavía falta la suficiente voluntad política para movilizar los recursos necesarios para garantizar la conservación, restauración y el uso sostenible de la biodiversidad. And that is why the world needs to aim high in Montreal for COP15 to adopt an ambitious global deal for nature. Europe is ready to aim high, but we must do this together. The evidence is overwhelming. Nature itself is now in existential peril. It is time for humanity to make peace with nature. We need to halt and reverse. To reverse biodiversity loss. By 2030. By 2030. So we have heard our leaders making their com commitment, making the call that we need to reverse the loss of nature to be nature positive by 2030. Before I get started, let me ask, because I don't know all the confirmed speakers, if you are speakers, please do come in the in inner circle and the you know, participants uh, in the, in the uh, outer circle. So actually this, you hear the leaders call. Let's see how, when they come into the negotiation table, what kind of a challenge, what kind of a situation they are facing. So I will show you the next video, a one minute video, please. Good evening. To those in attendance and the 
millions tuning in, welcome. Over the next few days, we'll have a once in a decade opportunity, a chance to heal our broken relationship with nature. Yes, we see the signs. Yes, we hear the sirens. And yes, we see the science. You have told us that we need to do something, that urgent action is required. But we regret to inform you that this won't be the year. This won't be the year we make a change. This won't be the year that we turn things around. We know we've let you down, but there is still time. It's not... It's not too late. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's not too late. To the leaders and decision makers attending the UN Biodiversity Conference in Montreal, what message will you deliver to the world? Make this the year that history is written. Take action to reverse biodiversity loss by the end of the decade and secure a nature-positive future for people and the planet. We're watching you. We're counting on you. We're believing in you. All eight billion of us. Okay, we are being watched. We are also watching. And we're watching for the actions to be taken. So again, for the newcomers, I'm Lin Lee, director, Senior Director of Global Policy Advocacy for WW International. Um, uh, again, I don't know all the speakers. If you have other speakers, please do come to the inner circle. And today we are using this time to really, knowing that the time of reaching agreement is really tight. And we are, don't have time to waste. So here we come here to share what our expectations are, what we like to see by the end of this negotiation time. So I have a very prestigious and wild, diver very diverse speakers on the panel, and they are coming from parties and non-parties, from south and the north, and we will hear from them, but also us, what is our expectation? So the program is going to run this way. I will, I will call up on you, and you have about no more than three minutes to talk about your top one, no more than three expectations. Keep in mind, a lot of our expectations are similar, so when you share yours, and also ready to hear what others are expecting for this. So the first one I'd like to call Marco Lampatini, Director General of WWF. So you have no more than three minutes to share your expectation. I love when my staff keeps keep me on my toes. That's wonderful. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining. And thanks particularly to our partners here. We've been a, a fantastic group, I think, working to work together on this. So don't count these 10 seconds. Um, I'll start now. The three minutes starts now. Uh, Look, one expectation. I'm going to start from the top, and, and my colleagues heard me before. Um, I think this is truly an historic opportunity to fill a gap that we've been having for many years. By not having clarified a clear global direction on nature, a clear global goal for nature that can be then translated into the right level of ambition in terms of implementation. On climate, we have the 1.5 that Paris endorsed, and, uh, uh, and the IPCC translated the 1.5 into net zero emissions by 2050, a pathway very clearly measurable, injecting strong accountability. Well, of course, we're not fast enough on climate, but imagine if we didn't have that clarity. Imagine if we didn't have 1.5 on net zero emissions. Where would we be? We'd be trying our best, but surely failing to do what's necessary. And I think I feel we've been in this situation on nature for many, many years. Now is the time to set that direction. Net zero for nature is not enough. Nature 
can come back. There's a huge ability to bounce back if we give it a chance. So that's why we're pushing for a nature positive. Whole turnovers biodiversity loss by 2030 is the equivalent to 1.5 uh, uh, degree uh, for climate. And net, a net positive uh, is biodiversity is the outcome for nature. That's what we need this conference to uh, agree to, set the direction, and then ins inspire a mechanism of setting the right targets that will deliver that ambition and ratcheting it up over time as well, exactly as we're seeing happening for climate. So nature positive, whole the reverse by 2030, nature positive. Last thing to say, I was delighted to hear yesterday the Chinese president and uh, the Prime Minister of Canada both mentioning whole the reverse by 2030. That's the minimum ambition that we really uh, have to codify. That's what's necessary as well. Thank you, Marco. So we want to halt and reverse the loss of nature to be nature positive. That's the first expectation. How to do that? What components will be there? Brian, would like to share. Brian is the CEO of Campaign for Nature. Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, as Marco said, the science is clear. We know that biodiversity has been declining at rates unprecedented in human history. Why is that happening? Well, we know that we are seeing land use change resulting in the loss of habitat, and we're seeing the over-exploitation of our oceans. So any biodiversity framework has to address those core components, and that is why an area-based conservation target is essential, because that goes to protecting the habitat and then stopping that over-exploitation of the oceans. I believe that any framework that doesn't include a target to protect and conserve at least 30% of the world's lands and oceans is not sufficiently ambitious to be um, an outcome of this COP. We know that 30% is the minimum that scientists tell us, so it's at least 30%. Many scientists say we need much more, so that's the bottom. We can't negotiate down from that. We need to negotiate up if we're going to be seeing changes to that target. But it's important, you know, 30 by 30 is a, is a short slogan, but there's a lot of components to that. The details are really critical. So a couple of those details that need to be in the target, one is that it needs to be rights-based. The rights and leadership of indigenous peoples and local communities is absolutely essential. And that's a, uh, that is a must-have within the 30 by 30 target, that we see that as part of it. Second, we need to make sure that the right areas for biodiversity are protected. It can't just be any area. It's got to be the, the most important ecosystems on the planet have to be included in that. Those areas need to be connected, and they need to be well-funded. And finally, we need to make sure they're effectively managed. It's not just about area. It's also about the areas that are included, how they're being protected and conserved. So a 30 by 30 target is a must-have. But in order to make it work, it has to have enough finance. We can't just create areas and not have the means of implementation. So finance is an essential component. So those are the areas that I think are essential if we're going to see a, a positive outcome in this COP and a must-have for any ambitious outcome. Thank you, Brian. So 30 by 30 and many conditions in there. We hear from non-state actors. Now I pass to uh, Ms. Jessica Amanshu. Uh, she's the Biodiversity Director of the Ministry of Environment of Peru. So she will share what is from her view about the com key component of the uh, GBF. Please, Jessica. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the GBF have to uh, go straight to goals that are uh, smart, uh, the indicators smart, and uh, concrete ac activities, actions to to obtain the, the main uh, objective or goal that is uh, preserve in uh, being in harmony with the nature. So we are in Peru, we are convinced that the, the nature is our natural capital, the most imp important natural capital, and go, going to, to give us uh, in, the, in the way to, for a sustainable development. So uh, in that way, we are working in natural protected areas and also with other uh, modalities of conservation areas. Uh, we call the, them OMEX. And uh, it involves the private sector, the gov national government, uh, local government, uh, regional government in different, uh, with different actors, and uh, especially with, uh, with or not commercial activities like tourism and uh, sustainable development, uh, commercialization of products of the forest, for example. No? And other important conservation areas are the agrobiodiversity. Uh, we have the uh, 
program for conservation, the forest that, that give uh, um, an amount of money to the conservation of the forest. But in agrobiodiversity, you know, we are the uh, center of, of domestication and uh, conservation of this kind of, of products. So, uh, there is no incentive for the farmers. And we're working to institutionalize one pilot that we're working with, with Biodiversity International to uh, make this compensation, this retribution for the farmers that are working in, in conservation of 300 of varieties of potatoes, 50 of corn, uh, different types. We are, it's enormous. Yeah and they need to be helped in this uh, work that is very hard and is a familiar work. So yeah. the communities, indigenous people have to be enforcing that. And uh, I agree that the financial support is essential. Without financial support, we, we cannot go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You hear protection, respecting rights, and financial, but protection, financial, we'll talk about it, so that's a big issue. But protection will not, protecting will, only protection will be enough or not. We will hear from um, Marina von Weissenberg, Senior Ministerial Advisor, Chief Negotiator of Biodiversity for Finland, to share her view on food and uh, mainstreaming, please. Yes, thank you, and I fully share the points already made on <coughs> nature positive and also nature positive uh, finance and economy, which we need. But I, I think one, of, one part of this whole package deal is not only the of course, the protection and, and, and restoration, which we need to have the third, at least 30%. But at the same time, uh, the ecological footprint in the global uh, goal B needs to be included. And we need to be very bold on and firm on that the protection in itself will not be enough if we can't make a change in the areas outside the protected areas, in the economic sphere, in the different sectors of of uh, uh, a society. And therefore, uh, goal D and targets 14, 15, and 16 are really important to get them right. Because without having the so-called mainstreaming of biodiversity into the di different sectors and the ownership of these sectors in this framework, I think uh, then we are in a small bubble again, and it's the only the Ministry of Environments who are going to deal with this. That said, it will be key to have a monitoring uh, and reporting framework to raise the accountability. I mean, we need to have indicators in place so we can measure the outcomes of this. So finally, uh, I think uh, that said, uh, the more we have numerical targets and smart targets, the better, and uh, the ecological footprint, from my point of view, we need to have. Thank you. Thank you. So we need protect. We also need half of our footprint. Otherwise, whatever we put aside for protection can be eaten by the different, not changed production consumption behavior. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. And then let's hear from um, our Kenya delegation, Dr. Paul Matiku. You know, share his view, please. Thank you. Uh, an ambitious global biodiversity framework, in my view, looks like the local communities in Masai Mara, in Amboseli, in Laikipia, who every day are waking up to their sheep, their livestock, their cows, their goats, their crops being eaten up by wildlife, losing millions every day, counting without any form of compensation because there is no money. These are people who are coexisting with nature. A lot of us want to visit tourist destinations and see the elephant, but the elephant at night is interacting with the people, the cheetah, the lion. And these survive in the, under the mercy of the local communities who incur all the costs. A successful global biodiversity framework must recognize that protection by governments and guns will never work, has failed. The communities, landowners have to be incentivized with sufficient incentives to engage in biodiversity conservation. We must also get the science right, because we have our protected areas in the wrong places, 
a lot of the things we are likely to lose are in the hands of private landowners. We have to put in the resources. There are concepts like Kimba and diverse areas cannot just be wished away in the name of conservation areas that look beautiful. We must look at the great things that are in the range of extinction. With all that money, $200 billion needed annually, 200 CBD parties, $1 billion for each party, is it going to be achievable? The commitments we are hearing, even in this conference, will not shake the challenge we have. Even if we sit down and construct the best words that says that we are going to save nature, without the means to do so, we are going to fail once, and, once again. Commitment, dedication to the ambition that we are going to have is critical. Otherwise, 2030, we meet here again and the count failure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So words, thank you. Here, allow. So the words need to turn into action. Otherwise, words just keep on words. So thank you for that. And we will need also hear from uh, Lolita from Gabon. Sorry, Lolita, sorry, sorry, very sorry. Lolita Kibongs from Palau delegation to share her view. Thank you. Is it on? Thank you. Um, yes, the global biodiversity framework has to um, help facilitate um, in country and in regions um, the ambition of 3030 that's most important to Palau. Um, and I think I can only speak from our own experience where we've taken um, the lead in establishing or in meeting the 30 by 30 goals. Um, right at the moment, uh, our reefs are protected at 58%, and that's in addition to the EEZ, as well as um, our terrestrial areas protected at 19.8%. Um, so we have to insist that everybody joins uh, the, this goal and that the global biodiversity framework looks to even improving uh, how to facilitate that better. And then um, spatial plans, both on land and um, on water, uh, we are entering into that. That's very important, uh, like what's been said. Um, we can protect the areas designated for protection, but right outside the perimeters need to be managed. And then lastly, the, um, the importance of having support, sustainable financing support, um, to ensure that uh, the, the, the biodiversity targets are maintained is really important. And just one last thing, science can, it, this is one of the things that needs to be acknowledged and uh, in traditional knowledge and indig indigenous indigenous traditional management needs to work in tandem with science. Mm. It cannot be just science alone. So traditional knowledge have to complement and, and, and work with sci science to be able to find management measures that are fit for the communities and can be sustained. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're here. The fortress, conver fortress conservation does not work. We need to rest, rec rest recognize and respect the traditional knowledge. And we need to include different players, stakeholders, join in the conservation now. I invite Patricia Jurita, from CEO of, CEO of BirdLife, BirdLife International, to share our, her thoughts on how do we bring people in the decision making which is inclusive and the conservation is inclusive, please. Thank you. Um, so we've heard we want ambition, we want clear protection, we want the inclusion of local communities. We want the right compensation processes. We want the right mobilization and mainstreaming. I'm going to say we want that, but we want it now, and we want with high ambition and commitment from all of the parties because we are too late. We cannot keep losing nature. We need a nature positive result by 2030. And we're not seeing that commitment. We're not seeing that ambition. We are settling for the lowest common denominator and that is not going to help us turn things around. So the moment is now and if we don't ask and demand commitment with strong targets, 
with clear numbers, with goals that are really going to get us there, we're not going to be able to maintain and sustain the life that we're living and the life that is decent for the younger generations. It is our responsibility, and you heard it from the minister today. It is now, and in Montreal, we cannot wait for another meeting. We have to make it happen now. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so the, we are watching, and the world is watching you and us. So this is something we all need to really work together, and now there's no time to waste. And in our discussion, we hear about a lot about financing resources. So let's hear from um, Andrew Joyce, the Director of Global Policy, Institutions, and the Conservation Finance, the C Nature Conservation, Nature Conservancy. So he will share of the discussion and the thinking behind how we think about a resource mobilization for the biodiversity. Andrew. So we need money. Right? That's probably a tautology that we all understand. And we understand that the money is essential to the deal and that the level of ambition is tied to the level of financial resources that are out there. So the money is critical. I have expectations that there are two, two parts to this. Right? We need both to finance green and to green finance. By financing green, I mean we need to find the successful pathway to close the $700 billion a year financing gap for nature so that the money is on the table to ensure the effective implementation of the global biodiversity framework. We had pretty good ambition in Aichi. We didn't have enough money and we didn't see the implementation. The elements are now on the table, right? We need the donor countries to increase their ODA and to ensure that the MDBs that they help direct are providing much more resources and that they're fully aligned with nature. We need all countries to increase their domestic resource mobilization and to deal with the harmful subsidies that are subsidizing the destruction of nature instead of helping it. We also need to, as I say, green finance to ensure the alignment of all public and private flows to be nature positive. So that means we need the private sector and the public sector to be able to dis understand, assess, disclose their impacts and dependencies on nature and set targets for themselves to shift, reduce the negative impacts on nature of, for their financial decisions and ultimately turn them positive. That's what the alignment of financial flows get, right? So it's both greening or financing green, providing the $700 billion gap gets closed and greening finance. To my mind, there were two critical outcomes from the Paris Climate COP. One was the Paris Agreement itself, the negotiated words that we all agreed to that set the commitments, the end, embedded the NDCs and embedded the ability to ramp up our, our um, commitments over time. But the other critical outcome of the Paris COP was how that was translated and received by actors in the real economy. Paris determined or the, the private sector heard the signal in Paris that the direction of travel of the global economy henceforth would be low carbon or carbon neutral. That business decisions, that business plans, that investment strategies needed to change to adjust to that new reality. So here in Montreal, we need two outcomes. We need a, an ambitious global biodiversity framework that closes the finance gap and sets the signal to align private and public financial flows. But we also need to make sure that the private sector understands that henceforth, the direction of travel of the global economy must also be nature positive as well as carbon neutral. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. And before we're hearing about from the business voices, I also wanted to say that we talk about the goals, targets, talk about financing. We also need to implement them. While implementing the GBF, we need all the all of society participating to do that. So with that, I will invite a few different voices to, from, from uh, different sectors to, sh to share their expectations. Uh, the first one, I will start with Tina. Your first name is Marie Nali, right? Director of Women for Biodiversity. Tina, please. Hello, everybody. I think pretty loud. No, thank you so much for this invitation to be here and share our experiences. 
It's really wonderful to hear the ambitions and you know, what we really want to do with the global biodiversity framework and aiming high. And I talked about protection. And I think also with, with what you talk about the Kenyan delegation, I just want to say that one of the things I think we can progress is, I always say it's very simple, prevention is better than cure. <laughs> What we really need to also keep in mind is when we're talking about the higher ambitions and we're talking about a whole of society approach, we don't forget that comes with rights. It comes with recognition of the rights of peoples, including indigenous peoples, women, youth. So either we're talking about um, you know, nature positive and talking about extension of protected areas, Again, like in Palau said, traditional knowledge is really very important. Uh, not only to kind of respect it, but also recognize it and see how it could be also part of, part of the equation. So I think what I really see is that the, the, the way we are aiming high, unless and until we really go down to the base and see that, okay, what drives that biodiversity loss? Um, we will kind of still run short of really addressing is what's really causing the problem then again, trying to see, let's have a solution for the problem. And nature is not pristine. Nature is not a standalone, um, I don't know, beautiful like this. And I bet if you go to these spaces, you will see that it's an, it's an ecosystem. We talk about species, you're talking about rivers, and talking about birds and the bees. And with that is also peoples. And if you look at, there is so much research saying that if you look at the most biodiverse areas in the world, 80% of that exists in areas where actually people exist. So we really need to have a recognition for that, but also saying that it's also for gender. You're talking about here I am, many of you knew my faces, on target 22 and why we are asking for that. They are half of the population of the world. We really need to have the shift saying that they can contribute, and they are. I always tell people, like, you know, as with women, you always have to make an argument. This is what women are doing. This is their contributions. This is, you know, we have data. But we actually never ask, how are men contributing <laughs> to biodiversity <laughs> conservation? We never, we don't have, I think, a research on what they're doing. But we feel that we, every time we come, we have to reiterate this. Come with examples, come with case studies that this is what women are doing, this is how they sustainably use and manage and conserve. But we never ask the other way around, but having to ask for their rights is we also tend to be on the sidelines saying that gender will be mainstreamed. But how that mainstream mechanism is going to be put in place, nobody knows. Yeah. All right, so I think that's really very, very important that when we're talking about these higher ambitions, we're also really realistic at what concrete actions should be put in place to first address first the drivers of biodiversity loss, ensure that when you talk about whole of society, that the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities, the women and the youth is recognized, but also ensuring that, that you know, we, we work collectively. Um, and also like, I'm not gonna put on the other one that financing is important and everything else, that's a done thing. But just saying that these are the simple they seem simple, but they're not. And I think it's very important for us to really have an understanding moving forward, because this is a framework for 30 years. If we fail this time, we will be again in the same thing. So it's important that when talking about whole of society, we actually truly engage in that discussion of how and how and actions can be done. Thank you, thank you so much. Women is half the sky, but we are only one sky. So we're all in together, men and women. All of us in together, you know, all the indigenous people, youth, women, men, you know, private, NGO, government, we're all in this together. And we see nature has been spread around from the usual community. We actually hear uh, three, more than 300 3, different organizations stand up to call to action to really work on nature. And the, one of them is from the faith group. So next, I would like to hear from uh, Mr. Gopal Patel, from co-chair of the UN Multi-Phase multi Advisory Council, to share their view on their expectation about the COP50 and the GBF, please. Thank you so much, it's a pleasure to be here. So today we're happy to announce that 55 religious organizations from across the world, representing tens if not hundreds of millions of people from all faith traditions, have endorsed multi-faith priorities for the GBF. 
Um, we have six priority areas. I'll share three of them today, which are in alignment with everything that's been shared. We agree that there needs to be strong ambition, uh, an equitable, rights-based, nature-positive goal needs to be there, that North Star, so we know what we're aiming for. We also agree, um, as was mentioned by Tina, that a rights-based approach, protecting indigenous peoples, women, youth, and other marginalized and vulnerable communities needs to be part of the GBF. And that we also believe that a strong implementation mechanism needs to be there so we know what to do once we leave Montreal in two weeks. We know the direction of travel. So those are the three of the three things. But the overarching message that the faith groups are coming out with um, is that we want people to recognize the sacredness of the web of life and that over the last 200 years, we've been telling a story and that story is no longer fit for purpose for the future. And there are values that underpin that old story. So what we want to see coming out of the negotiations here are a new set of values that underpin a new story for human nature relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> we are in one, we are all in one. Uh, the next one, which I actually don't know the speaker, Flor Florina Lopez, are you here? Okay, so sorry, she's not here. Let, you know, now let's move. Somebody mentioned the, the role of business sector, right? So now I'd like to move to our business colleagues from a very progress business looking at the nature. So the next speaker is um, Ms. Marelle Pallison. She's the ad um, advocacy director for Business for Nature. Please. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks. Um, I think we will see that it's the first time that so many businesses will be attending a nature cop. And they are coming because they realize that nature is a material issue for their business. They are starting to take action. It is not enough. We need a system change, and the GBF can start creating this system change. So we're here in Montreal with two main expectations. The first one has been said already. It's this global goal for nature. Mm. We need that to set the direction of travel for businesses, to create a momentum, to accelerate action, for, to, so that all businesses after COP15 can go back to their board and say, this is the objective. We need to transform our strategy. We need to transform our business model to align with this global goal. The second expectation is to change the rule of the economic system. And for this, we have two expectations in the GBF. The first one is target 15. We need to have in target 15 mandatory requirements for all large business and financial institutions to assess and disclose their impact, risks, and dependencies on nature. It needs to be made mandatory to create a level playing field, to accelerate action, Governments need this information to take the right decision. Investors need this information to make the right investment and align the financial flows. Consumers need this information to make informed choices. IPLCs need the information to, to enforce their rights. So this is really something that is a game changer that we want to see in Target 15. The second one of changing the economic game is the, the subsidies, so we need a full reform of environmentally harmful subsidies and incentives. Today the world is paying one, more than 1.8 trillion uh, of harmful subsidies per year. We need to transform that. We cannot be serious in achieving the goal of the framework if we don't transform this. And the businesses are ready to engage with governments on, on finding pathways. It's not easy finding pathways, pilots, projects, and how this can be made. And on top of all of this, we support all the other um, <laughs> priorities of it that everyone yeah. mentioned. Thank you, thank you, Mal. So we hear about a 1.3 trillion uh, harmful investment or subsidies are in, in putting into nature. Think about, we're in a house, a house on fire, and we're putting water and oil both in there, but we put 10 times more oil than the water in because our conservation spending is one magnitude lower than actually our damage, our investment that damage in nature. So that's really not what I like to see. And also business, we also see them. There are progress business that we can see, and we will hear next as well, uh, the collision of them. But there are also business trying to undermine uh, our negotiations. So we need really be careful and uh, working together. Let me hear another progress business coalition to, uh, from a capital coalition. So the next speaker is Mark Gall, CEO of Capital Coalition, to share his expectation. Thank you. And I was really worried, Patricia, because when we were there this morning, we were both meant to be giving statements and they ran out of time. So we didn't get to speak in the open plenary. So I was really worried then uh, being last, I wouldn't get a chance to speak here. Um, 
I think the, the key thing for me is, and we're, we're not actually a business coalition. We work with governments, we work with finance, we work with civil society. Oh, okay. We bring all of them together. And I think that's the key thing here, sitting in this room. I could repeat everything that's been said here. I agree with everything that's been said so far. We were one of the founders of Business for Nature. I really think that the mandatory assessment and disclosure would be a game changer because the frameworks, the tools are already there. The Natural Capital Protocol was launched in 2016. It's been applied by thousands of businesses already. We've got those tools. TNFD will come out this year. Science-based targets will come out this year. So we, oh, sorry, next year, in the next year. We're gonna have all those tools. We've got those tools. I think the message I would actually have here is we're gonna do this anyway. Actually, the momentum is there. We are going to take this forward, no matter what is decided in this hall. We have got those businesses, we've got the communities here. We are going to deliver this, so they better get on with it in that hall and make those decisions, because we're going to take it forward anyway. Thank you, thank you so much. That's what we all need to do. You know, we will do anyway. We will push for the negotiation, we need to push for the strong GBF to guide us, but we, each one of us, we will do that anyway. So, so I'm really good at managing time because I have some time to, you, you are really good at keeping time, so thank you. I actually have some time for open to the floor. Um, so I was thinking if I don't have time, I will not open to the floor, and now I have. So I like open the floor for so you to make an intervention, but also keep in mind, not long, but just your expectation, or you like to share with uh, our speakers or question, that'd be good. So uh, do, uh, do say who you are and then say what you're expecting or want to exchange, please. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Porik Fogarty. I work for an NGO in Ireland called the Irish Wildlife Trust. Um, many of the things that you have said today, I think have been said before, we've been saying them for a very long time, about financing, about local communities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm wondering, are we talking about two very significant drivers for biodiversity loss? Uh, one of them is uh, our addiction to economic growth, and the other is livestock farming. Are those being discussed here at COP? Because I think they need to be. Thank you, that's a two good points. Do I have any uh, speaker like to take that question? <laughs> okay, Marco then. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, that's very nice of you. I'm gonna pay you back the next panel. <laughs> Look, you're raising two super important questions. Uh, and points. Uh, on the livestock, I would say, I, I guess you're talking about consumption patterns and talking about uh, high footprint food and diets. And there is no doubt, no doubt, that in order to uh, drive a, a agriculture uh, towards a nature positive outcome, diets need to change. Uh, maybe not radically, like many would love, but definitely in the direction of uh, a lower footprint of today. I have no doubt about that. The latest statistics are mind-blowing about the footprint of, uh, of red meat consumption uh, production and, uh, and actually the very limited contribution to calories and proteins to the global, global uh, population compared to plant-based diets. So on that one, I'm completely on the same page. And uh, uh, talking about halving the footprint, like Marina said earlier, that implies for sure, not just the production dimension, but the consumption as well. Uh, the first one, uh, the first one is a tricky one, but you know, it's not about addiction to growth. I think it's a question of distribution of wealth. I think that's the biggest problem of today. We are growing economically in a way which is totally inequitable, and I think that needs to be addressed, um, partially through the redirection of, uh, of, uh, of finances that goes in, in support of the South, not just in terms of conservation, but in terms of economic development as well. But it's a, bigger, it's a big question for a panel on its own. Yeah, thank you. And also, Marina, would you like to share? You talk about halving the footprint, so let's see. Yeah, I mean, uh, it works now. Hello, hello. No. Uh, what I think is really important is uh, about the, is exactly the consumption patterns, because the livestock and the red meat and all this is, of course, one issue. But in this framework, we are not going to put any limits on how much livestock is, is acceptable or not acceptable. That, that's not the point. But the thing is that, uh, the good thing is that without brackets, we already have this agroecological, was it uh, under target 10, uh, which, which we managed already to get, and I think that's really good. That means uh, organic farming uh, and, and also uh, uh, farming practices which are biodiversity friendly. And of course, as we know, uh, the fish stock, uh, use of meat, we have uh, WWF has done fantastic uh, reports on that, and I think that's up to us, ourselves. 
I mean, we have to change our behavior and, and uh, the, eat, uh, the, the consumption patterns and, and, and the waste, uh, uh, food waste. I mean, that's another thing which is in these targets, uh, uh, which is really important. And we have to half, and that's uh, halving the food waste as well. So uh, as stated, targets 14, 15, and 16 has to do with, with the mainstreaming of governments. Then we have the business sector, and then we have the consumers. So this, your question relates to that. And then we have on sustainable use, how we use agriculture, uh, land and stuff, that comes under uh, target uh, 10. Uh, one target which I just want to say, which I think is, is going to be really crucial, is target seven on pollution and uh, the issue of fertilizers and, 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 and uh, waste all in all. And I think this target will be, we will have a huge battle. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, I will I just say a few things. So food is the number one driver for biodiversity loss. So that's a really good question. And if we do change our protection consumption behavior, reduce the waste, change our diet, we actually can sustain our 8 billion people on life without really damaging uh, biodiversity. Oh, okay, please, you wanted to, to share with that point? Okay, sorry, I didn't see your hand. So I fine. did not want to speak, but I just felt like I should say this. Uh, many times we want to see elephants, cheetahs, as long as we will not stay with them. <laughs> many times we want to have good food and good life, as long as we are not responsible for the consequences. It's time to take responsibility for our actions. And during this um, uh, conference or parties, we have had those who have cared to carry out an analysis and have said that at least 30% of biodiversity loss is driven by consumption in some parts of the world. And the same research is showing that 50% of loss of biodiversity in some parts of the world is a responsibility of someone else. So every day they are exporting biodiversity loss in this conference, we are saying, let's take responsibility. Are we ready to take responsibility in this unequal world? That's a question we possibly need to answer and go back home to save nature. But if we don't change to take responsibility, are we going to achieve? Consumption patterns is a real threat, and we have to look at our way of life if nature is to be saved. Thank you, thank you so much. We actually, each one of us has, each one of us has a responsibility. Each one of the countries also have a responsibility because we only have this one earth for us. So I have a round for, an, uh, for another few questions. So let me, I saw three, four hands. Can I go with the four hands as one go and then let we share? So I, I, for she first, she, she has been patiently waiting, thank you. Say who you are and then we Thank you. Oh, sorry. I'm Harriet Bulkley. Uh, I'm a professor at uh, Durham University in the UK. Um, you asked for our expectations, and thank you, panel, for sharing yours. Uh, my first would be that we could get a catchier slogan for all of these mainstreaming and underlying drivers issues to match the 30 by 30. There's a real risk, I think, that 30 by 30 will take the headlines and we'll feel that we've got a good agreement at the end of it, and we need not to just focus on that. Uh, my second... Uh, Do you have a suggestion to that? <laughs> yeah, nature positive is good, but it, you know, what does it mean when you actually implement it? My second thing would be that when we're thinking about putting uh, nature aside, we must think about the nature that matters to people. It's not just nature for nature, right? And if we don't look at the critical natural assets, we won't get anywhere either. Uh, and my third point, uh, and I would say this because I'm very much part of the city's constituency here, we haven't heard the voice of cities and regional governments in the, in the room yet. Uh, we will in the next couple of weeks. But at least nine of the targets that are on the table cannot be achieved without urban and subnational action. And we're not thinking about what the targets and indicators look like that they can actually implement. We need to have targets that are smart for cities as well as smart for national governments. So those are my expectations. That one I can do. The first, uh, the natural, um, the critical natural areas target, we can do that as well. There's a great paper out in science this week which shows us where those places are. The top yeah. one is much more difficult, and I know that, but okay. I still think we need to keep working sure. on it. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's all think about what is the word that we can use uh, talking about, you know, reducing the drivers, uh, like the 30 by 30, like nature positive. Let's think about that. So I saw uh, three hands over there. Yeah, please. Thank you, Pella Thiel, Stop Ecoside International. And uh, I'm hearing a lot of, you know, we have a lot of good targets, we have a lot of good knowledge, but there is a real lack of implementation and accountability. And as you said, we are all responsible, but how do we act? How, how, and some people are actually more responsible than others. So how can those also take their responsibility. So I would want to know, is ecocide law part of the discussion and that is having ecocide as a fifth international crime within the criminal court, which is another institution than the CBD, but I think something that's really needed now to, to make the GBF happening. So is that part of the discussion you're having? Yeah. Th thank you for sharing expectation. Maybe I'd like me get a few and then we will do a response. A gentleman over there, do you have a mic? Okay. Okay, thanks to uh, everyone who presented today. I'm Crystal Mew um, from Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario. Um, I might mumble myself a little bit through this question, but you know, through the presentations today and in the presentations I heard on the floor, you know, I heard things like web of life, prevention is easier than the cure. I mean, these are, these are ultimately health terms. And when I listen to everything that has happened today, I, I really can't help but feel that you know, uh, the biodiversity movement and the GBF, what it's really all about, you know, is, is a global health initiative, okay? Yet the framework itself does not even identify or explicitly recognize the health sector. And I find that to be a major limitation here. And again, the undertone throughout this entire conference is about health. And I mean, I guess I, the question I have is, does anyone disagree with me in the sense that healthy bio, biodiverse ecosystems are the foundation For to human health, health and well-being and prosperity of all life on earth. Yeah. And if you, if you do agree, then why isn't the health sector here, like, you know, at this table? Because that can be a major actor and ally in achieving the goals and targets of the GBF. And, you know, just think about the influence of the health sector in terms of resources, in terms of contact throughout your entire lifespan. Doctors are prescribing nature, et cetera. But anyway, so it's more of a challenge and a question, and if you have any comments, it'd be great to hear that. Thank you. Let me hear the, yeah, please, one more, yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, Chloe King, Solomar International, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge. Um, I would really love for one of the panelists to be able to address the, the challenges with this term nature positive. I think we've seen the failure of carbon offsetting and, and the sort of inequitable distribution of the challenges that we faced. And, um, over the past several decades since, since this was originally agreed under, under climate agreements. And I, am, I think many of us in, in this conference today are extremely concerned that we're creating very perverse incentives by implementing and, and creating biodiversity offsetting as one of the main ways of, uh, within this nature positive framework. Um, and so how are we making sure that biodiversity and nature is not just going to become the new frontier of capitalism? Thank you, thank you very much. First of all, I will say, Panelists don't have all the answers. We are here to share our expectation together, but we, we do discuss. So if, if any panelists would like to, to kind of respond to the, the questions, please do, please. So on the um, nature positive and what is it, on Friday, I think it is, we released from the Global Goal Group nine principles, eight principles, sorry, uh, and two for national scale, and then three for business and enterprise around that. So there's lots of different parts of it. But when we met in 2019, I think it was, was in Geneva, and started saying, well, you need something to focus on, and Nature Positive is a calling card for that, that was really key to start bringing all of our teams together to start saying, okay, so how can we deliver it? We didn't, in 2019, have an answer for that, but the principles, the processes are now coming in place to deliver that. So I think it's wrong to think that there isn't that in place at the moment. Nature positive is what we're aiming for. And I think that the whole idea about um, this is just a way to bring in offsets is completely wrong. I've heard that several times today, and it's completely 
not true. I haven't, that isn't where we're coming from. What we're coming from is trying to make nature positive. So all of the statements that have been coming out from the Global Gold Group have been saying that it's not about those offsets. It's not about just trying to find a way to put it into an offset project. I think one final thing, just quickly on that, the um, carbon offsets and carbon credits, there has been lots of problems with that. When that was started up, it was agreed that that wouldn't be done with any governance in place. They'd let the markets run it. And that was the meeting in Turkey that sort of set up all of that process. We are now with biodiversity credits starting with the point that we need governance, bottom-up governance, to actually understand that. So we've got an opportunity to do it different with biodiversity credits than we did with climate credits. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, please, Patricia. So I'm going to second what Mark said. By the, um, nature positive doesn't mean offsetting. The first thing that we're saying with nature positive is protect what we have, conserve and manage it right, with right-based approach, with communities involved, with indigenous people knowledge guiding it. But yes, absolutely restore what has been damaged because we need it back, number one. Number two, health. We, one of the things that we have been campaigning for, and we started campaigning at the beginning of the pandemic, is the right to a, uh, to a, to a healthy environment. We managed to get United Nations General Assembly to enshrine the right to a healthy environment as one of our rights in the, in the um, UN um, uh, Declaration of Human Rights. Every single one of us has the right to a healthy environment and we recognize that nature is the basis of our health. So yes, I absolutely agree with you. We need more of the health sector involved in this, but this is something that the governments also have to recognize that in order to maintain their populations healthy, we need to have nature safe, protected and restored. Thank you, thank you very much. So nature, protecting nature is for the nature and for people, for all of us. Um, so before we leave, I still have a video, but before that video, I also wanna have uh, Patrick to, to talk about, he has an event right after this to continue the dialogue. Where's Patrick? Oh, here, okay. Yeah, so please introduce yourself and then sure. invite um, people to, to your next event. Yeah, Patrick Rick from the Global Comments Alliance. So two things need to happen for us to succeed. One is exactly what Mark said. Here's, we're all focusing on the negotiations. A lot of the conversation has been focused on that, but we also need the action agenda, post-GBF action agenda. And that's the next session that's gonna take place here with Manuel Pulgar Vidal, our biodiversity champion. action champion. Yes. And the second thing that really needs to happen is after this session, if you just could move that direction so we can set up the room then you set us up for success for the okay. next hour and a half. That one Thank I you. will do very soon. Okay. So we know the time's calling. Uh, before we all leave, I want to, so first of all, I cannot summarize all the rich discussion. So, but you hear it. You hear from your ears, go into your mind. And then let me show you a video so you can take this message away. The video, please. It unites us. down through generations, helping us grow and reach new heights. It's seen every emotion, every cheer, every tear, and it's been through countless seasons without complaint, but it's been kicked, punched, and thrown for far too long. It can only take so many strikes, and soon it'll be damaged beyond repair. No, this isn't any ordinary ball. It's the only kind there is in the universe, and it's going through its toughest match yet, where the stakes are at their highest. This not-so-little ball of blue and green needs our help, and losing isn't an option. But we have a once-in-a-decade chance to win, to turn the match around. Not for gold or glory, but for all 8 billion of us on the same team. At the 15th United Nations Conference on Biodiversity, we must score a goal. That means the world literally committing to reverse nature loss by the end of the decade. We don't have many opportunities left to turn things around. There is no half-time break. There is no extra time. There is no next season. World leaders take the pitch. Humankind is watching, and it's your time to kick off. 
make history and secure a nature positive future for the planet and us. And now. So thank you very much for the rich sharing and also carry this forward. So I kindly request for you to want us to do continue dialogue and networking to move to that way so they can set up for the next call. Thank you, thank you all very much. And let's get our job done here now. Thank you. Det är en del som 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 är en